There were lots of people who said, you shouldn't do this. We looked at various things and the ideas never quite got enough momentum with Feel Unique. It's kind of what happened. We put £70,000 of our own money into it and never raised a penny. The only time more money came into it was when we sold half the company to private equity in 2012. What prompted you to go into therapy? So I found myself kind of getting anxious more and feeling a bit down when I shouldn't really be. Why do I feel like off and why am I getting stressed and anxious? Just went down this awful spiral of kind of declining mental health. Was it the right decision to bring in the private equity and to sell to private equity? My heart says. Quick question. When did you discover that you're a leader? that your actions matter to those that look up to you. You may be an entrepreneur or an aspiring entrepreneur, innovating to change the world, or a CEO navigating a crisis, or a parent returning to work and learning to lead your career, your team, your children. There are many faces of leadership, and this is the podcast to explore them all. Welcome to Anatomy of a Leader with me, Maria Vorostovsky. I'm a headhunter and founder of HVO Search, where I help ambitious leaders hire their executive teams. My job today on this show is to help you discover your superpowers, to help you avoid making some of the same mistakes, and to remind you that even if you do, perfection doesn't and shouldn't exist. Thank you so much for listening, and please do subscribe and follow this podcast because it really helps others to discover these incredible stories. This show will challenge the way you think and may even change your life. Aaron, thank you so much for coming on to Anatomy of a Leader. So good to have you here. Thank you very much. I've been looking forward to meeting with you and to talking with you. You are the co-founder of Feel Unique and yeah. it's a brand that I have basically grown up with, or at least my hair has, because as I said to you before, that was the first place that I was shopping online for Kerastase products mm -hmm. and have continued to shop consistently for many years. So over 10, 12, maybe even 15 years. So we started Feel Unique in 2005. I think we probably got mm -hmm. Kerastase when we opened our first hair salon in 2007. Yes. So be probably since about, well, that's certainly when we... That sounds, sounds, that sounds about right. Probably in the very, yeah, very long, early days. You stayed that long. I did mm -hmm. because, well, I was familiar with it and it was just like the best place for me to to shop from. And then I continued buying everything else. So very excited to speak with you. Thank you. And very curious about your founder journey, about you know how you started and all of the phases that the business has gone through. Um, so let's start in the beginning. Uh, why did you start the business in the first place? So the short-ish version of it is that I, in my, when I left school, I wanted to be a professional musician, spent a few years playing the drums. Um, but I always had it in my head. I knew lots of musicians who were getting older and older and older and amazing musicians that never really made it. So I had it in my head that if I got to the age of 25 and I wasn't going to crack music, I'd get a proper job. And I did exactly that. You know, I did okay for a few years, bummed around, did various, various roles. But at 25, I went and got a proper job. And I'd been doing some sort of part-time telesales in marketing. And at 25, I basically got offered a full-time job by one of the companies that I'd been doing some, some work for. And I was there a very short time. And then I got a, an offered a role at a company called Cable and Wireless, which was a big telecoms operator in the eighties. And I spent six years there and worked my way up did some, you know and eventually ended up working in the kind of internet technologies part of the business which was very much when the world wide web was starting to emerge got sent to the caribbean for a year to help set up um an isp a internet service provider in 1995 um called carib surf which was the cable and wireless kind of um isp throughout the caribbean region um, from a marketing perspective. So that was my first kind of introduction to the internet and e-commerce, but it was very much at a kind of service level. And I came back and did a year with cable and wireless in Europe in 1996 and realized that a lot of the clients that we were talking to at the time didn't, we, you know, we were kind of 
getting them excited about the World Wide Web and what it could could do because obviously Cable and Wireless wanted to sell them the infrastructure to be allow, to be able to allow them to to utilize it. But what hap- what was happening was that a lot of my clients were having difficulty once they kind of got into the idea that they needed a website. Where do we go and get a website built? And for the first time in my life at the age of, I think about 28, 29, I thought, you know what, there is something in this and maybe there's an opportunity to leave Cable and Wireless and to start my own company and to actually build websites for other people. So I recognized that my limitations were great um, my, my own skills were fairly limited in terms of building a web design agency. So I recruited uh, a co-founder who was super creative. He'd been um, kind of graphic design lead at BMW, had done loads of amazing stuff, but was also starting to dabble in the web. And at this time, there weren't a lot of web designers out there. So he kind of brought the creative side and joined as co-founder, creative director. And basically, we we, we launched a boutique web design company in 1996, at the end of 1996 in Oxford. Um, we were very lucky in that we had access to a portfolio of companies that were interested in working with us through one of our investors. And basically we built the company up over three years and sold it in June, 2000, um, to a publicly listed software company. Um, and anyone who knows their internet history would know that July, 2000 was when the dot-com bubble burst. So it was it was more through luck than judgment, but the timing was great. So I mean, we sold the business, became part of a bigger organization, and then I stepped down later that year. But I had what I had a four year earn out. So they bought the business, paid a chunk of cash and shares, but some of it came over the, the following four years. And as part of that earn out, I was not allowed to start another internet related business. So in the sideline to that as I was building that company. Um, and by the time we sold it, we we had about, I think, 24 employees. We were building websites for people like Sky TV, uh, Antico Flooring. Um, we did some work for Jaguar Land Rover. We had a nice portfolio of business. And we sold the business, I think, for about six and a half million pounds in total. Mm. So it wasn't it wasn't a life changing event given that we had investors and we had our, we had ourselves, but it was great at 29 to be able to you know, make some money and, and exit a business. Um, alongside running that business, I was also an advisor and um, was a panelist on a couple of Sky television shows. Um, so I'd been been doing that alongside. So when we sold the company, I carried on doing my kind of advisory stuff and s- still involved with Sky television. And I moved back to Jersey. I was born in Jersey, but I'd been li- I grew up in Australia, been living in in the UK when we built the company. So I moved back to Jersey in 2004, um, and this was about when the earnout was coming to an end. So in 2004, when I knew that in you know several months I'd be able to finally start another company um, because I'd probably become unemployable at that point, having exited a business, the idea of going back to being an employee in another organization would be very difficult. For you, or is that how you perceived it? For me. Yeah. I think for a lot of people. Mm. And it's psychological because obviously I could, you know, I had the ability to go and work for somebody else, but psychologically, uh, I think it just would have been, it would have been a challenge. And and at that point I didn't, don't get me wrong, we hadn't made enough money that we could do what we wanted, but we'd made enough to be kind of comfortable and not, not be pressured about having to jump in and do a job that I didn't like. And I was kind of doing okay with bits and pieces of things that we had on the go, a few investments and and various things. But I knew that, you know, longer term, I had to do something more substantial. So as the internet was coming to an end, a very good friend of mine, a very old friend of mine, who's super operational, very financially minded, um, had been working in banking and finance and then was running his brother's business in Jersey where I lived. I said to him, look, you know, my earnout's coming to an end soon. I'm going to start another web, desi- web design company when I can in Jersey because there was a growing market for it there when I'd gone back. Um, and he said, well, look, if you do that, I really want to get out of what I'm doing. Maybe we could do something together, both put a little bit of money in, start a company. Uh, and that was the plan in 2004. Um, but at the time, two of our good friends had a business called Play.com in Jersey. Um, Play.com in 2005 was turning over, you know, I think, in excess of 500 million. 
they were doing DVDs, CDs, video games. That was their core business. They didn't, they, you know, they'd been going a few years, but they were at the time probably Jersey's biggest employee employer. They had, you know, they had warehousing and people in Cambridge and Heathrow, uh, and they were a massive success story and and very well known in Jersey. And as part of the conversation I was having with Richard, who ultimately became co-founder of Feel Unique, was we um, we were thinking about launching a web design company. And I, and I said to him, look, do you know what? If we build an agency, you can only ever scale an agency so big. You know, yes, we can pay the school fees and yes, we can have a nice life and a nice income, but you can't create, it's very difficult unless you WPP or Saatchi or whatever, but these have taken decades and decades and decades to build um, and multiple acquisitions, et cetera. The only way to really scale, you know, the, an agency is only ever going to scale so quickly. And I was like, and if you look at the success of Play.com by being client side rather than agency side in e-commerce, these guys are like smashing it, you know. And at that time in 2005, there were an, there were a handful of companies really making waves in e-commerce. Amazon owned books. That was really their thing back then. Yes, they were starting to branch out and Jeff Bezos was having all these conversations about being the everything store. But at that point, they weren't. Um, Netta Porter was starting to get, you know, high end fashion. ASOS were breaking through into high street fashion. Um, and there were a few players that were owning verticals. So I said to Richard, look, rather than um, doing the agency, maybe we could think about is there a vertical that we could go after in the way that Play.com went after DVDs and CDs, et cetera. And we both came to the conclusion that, yeah, you know, given where the, the kind of state of e-commerce was in 2005, there's a significant opportunity. And if we get it right, yes, we could potentially own a vertical or own enough of a vertical to create something substantial. So we spent a couple of months batting around some terrible ideas. Um, we looked at doing digital cameras and, and actually got quite close to doing that. In 2005, digital cameras were a big thing. Um, thank God we didn't now. <laughs> um, because I, don't, and I actually don't, I, back then everyone had one and now I can't think of anyone who uses one on a regular basis mm -hmm. apart from professional photographers. Um, we looked at music downloads at a time when Apple were just starting to break through with Apple Music. We looked at various things and the ideas never quite got enough momentum to break through. And I often say that as an entrepreneur, I have loads of ideas, loads of, you know, and loads of entrepreneurs have ideas. But for me, the idea kind of starts at a certain level and over a period of, you know, hours, days, weeks, or months, it either tracks down or it tracks up and it tracks down based on, you know, research, you know, the cost of entry is worse than you thought. Supply chain is more difficult. There's more competitors, more barriers to entry. And slowly your idea drops to a point where you've forgotten it ever happened. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have an idea and the opposite happens. You you think this is a great idea and you start to think about how, why, what could go wrong, what could go right. Um, and the idea starts to gain momentum and it gets to the point where you have to do it. Um, and I think that's happened three times. Once when I did the the web design company um, and then with, with, with Feel Unique, it's, this is, it's kind of what happened. I was... Um, I was in Dublin, had gone, had been, I'd been to a party all night long in Jersey and I had to go to Dublin the next morning for a meeting. And I, it was one of those times where you're up late at night and I don't do this anymore because I'm a lot older, <laughs> but it was like, it was 12 o'clock and I'm like, I've got to go soon. I've got to be on, I've got to get up at five to get a seven o'clock flight. So I'm going to have to go soon. And then one o'clock you're like, oh, I've really got to go now. <laughs> But then by two o'clock, it's like, well, there's no point going, going now yeah. because <laughs> I'm not going to get to sleep. So I basically stayed up, went straight to the airport, went, got this flight, did the, had to fly via Southampton on to Dublin, got to Dublin, did the meeting, guy dropped me back at the airport and I was dying at the airport. Um, and at that point, I was one of those guys that my beauty regime was like a bar of soap and a you know, a bottle of head and shoulders shampoo. At least you had one. That would, yeah. <laughs> pretty, yeah, well, it's better than some, but not as good as most. Um, so my beauty regime was very, very limited. And I remember being in Dublin airport with a, the worst hangover. And I can say that with confidence now because I don't really drink, so I don't feel like some sort of alcoholic, but it was a one-off <laughs> um, with the worst hangover. And I was, I had a few hours to kill before my flight. 
and I was just wandering around duty free. And as I've wandered past the Clinique um, counter, this girl behind the thing says, can I, can, I, can I help you? And I was like, no, I'm fine, just looking. And she, she said, oh, would you like to try some moisturizer? And for the first time in my life, you know, can imagine I've like, been up all night, my skin was dry, I felt terrible, I was just dehydrated. And I was like, actually, yeah, go on then. So she gives me some more. I was like, I was like oh, do you know what? Actually, that feels really nice, especially mm -hmm. after having the night I've had. Mm -hmm. So she persuaded me to buy some. So I spent twenty-seven pounds or whatever it was on a tube of Clinique M lotion, and um, I remember sitting on the plane on the way back to Jersey, thinking about having just bought this moisturizer, which is probably even at like twenty-nine thirty. I'm ashamed to say it's probably one of the first moisturizers I'd ever bought myself. Um, and I remember thinking, actually, I'm kind of into this now. It feels good. And I probably do need to take better care of my skin. And how am I going to get more of this? And the first thing that came to my mind was Clinique. I'm going to have to go to like department store. And I'm going to have to, and it's kind of slightly intimidating at that point, 29 year old guy going to a department store, you know, white coat at that point, you know, very, very orange face, self tan kind of like environment that, that was going on back then. And I was like, oh got to go and go through that and I was like if if I wonder if I could buy it online and then I thought hang on a minute I can't I I can't if you'd ask me where would I buy books online I can I'd go Amazon where would you buy fashion I'd go you know ASOS if DVDs I'd go play.com but I don't know it's not something's not springing to mind that you would go to x.com to buy beauty products so that's when I was like ah there's a thing maybe we should start a business selling men's beauty products online so i remember when the plane touched down i phoned richard as i was walking from like the plane to the terminal back in jersey richard my co-founder who had been speaking about and um i said i think i've got the idea and he's like super cynical very different to me um this i don't mean this to sound badly but he will see the difficulties in a situation before he'll see the opportunity, which is a good thing because with my sense of optimism, you need that balance. And um, I remember phoning up and said, look, Rich, I think I've got the idea. And he's like, oh, again. And I was <laughs> like, one. no, no, I think this is it. And I, I basically explained to him that we should, we should sell beauty products online. And he's very calm and measured. And I was hoping he'd go, yeah, this is great. And he's like, oh, I'll give that some thought. Anyway, I think we spoke later on or whatever. And he was like, actually, do you know what? I think this could be it. So we ended up doing about two or three months of research. There was a few, there was quite a few players in the market at the time, but they were all kind of, they all had this, well, many of them had this kind of sense of being um, not unprofessional, but kind of, you know, like the, one of the biggest ones was called Strawberry Net was based in Hong Kong. You know, there was, there was, there, there had this kind of underground feel. They didn't have this super professional, trusted, brand that that you know if you went to Debenhams or John Lewis or you know Netta Porter that you'll you only get that experience so I think from a from a consumer perspective even I would be thinking if I buy from there is it going to arrive it looks a bit tacky it looks a bit promotional it looks a bit discounty so we did a lot of research there was a few players out there but nobody really doing it well and doing it in a kind of holistic way there was a couple that were doing just hair like HQ hair and looked fantastic at the time mainly focused on hair but there were none there was no real kind of dominant player that was doing, you know, the full kind of range of skincare, makeup, hair care, et cetera. Um, and that's where the idea originally came from. So I think from that point of the idea, which was about March, we spent a couple of months doing proper market research, product market fit, planning it. Um, we put 70,000 pounds of our own money into it and never raised a penny. Um, we launched, we had a plan that we would get to profitability in month 18. I think we got profitable in about month 17. And then the business never required further investment. The only time more money came into it was when we sold um, half the company to private equity in 2012. So that's in a nutshell, the shorter version <laughs> of how Feeling It came into existence. Going back to what you were saying earlier about having lots of ideas as an entrepreneur and, yeah. you know, through the process, you kind of discover that actually, no, it's it's not a viable one. Is there a process that you have followed or is it something that happened along the way or how did you determine that these ideas were not going to work out? 
Um, I don't think there's a formula. There's certainly not a book that we read. And and I think if there were, um, the the landscape would be very different. Mm -hmm. I think part of what makes, I guess, I'm loath to use the word successful because I find it's kind of almost sort of judgmental to an extent. I don't, I think successful is not just about creating a business that you've sold to LVMH for 132 million quid. I think you can have a really successful patisserie on the high street. You know, degrees of success is about, you know, mm -hmm. doing what you set out to achieve. So in our case, you know, we set out to achieve, we wanted to create the net -a porter of beauty, if you like, or the ASOS of beauty. So by that measure of success, yes, we were successful. But I think, I think what makes a successful entrepreneur in that context of um, whether it's, you know, creating a Feely Nico or a Porter or Facebook or whatever, um, it's, I think it's more about, it's, it's how you go through that process really is going to kind of determine the outcome of, of success or not. So for us, it was, I think probably for everyone it's different, but I think that's part of what makes that I think anybody who can create any business and keep it sustain sustain it and it's making money it's paying for your lifestyle that's that's you know that's that's a success and they would have all gone through that process so for us it was about you know it's it's really the kind of the basics with a product market fit is there a market for what we want to do and for us that that was kind of the first part of that is a massive tick because we're a retailer so the market for the product is already predetermined People buy Clinique products, people buy Chanel products, people buy benefit products. The market exists. The product market fit element comes for us is are people are people gonna buy online at that point? Um, you know, they weren't buying online at that point. And the brands in the main, most of them weren't even selling online at that point. We, it, you know, it was very, very early, um, especially the heritage brands. So for us, it was like the 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 product mark the, the product is is a, is a given. We believed, given the trajectory of of online retail in other sectors, whether it was fashion, whether it was digital cameras, whether it was you know music, books, whatever, was definitely tracking upwards. And at some point, beauty was going to catch up. So we believed that we, we and we and that was really a lot of that was really kind of you know just knowledge that we had from being you know, kind of in the industry and having worked in e-commerce as well and then it was you know then there's like the the the, com the how much com competition is out there are they dominant and threatening enough that they could shut us down or it's just going to be too hard to break through and clearly if we were going to be launching a book website at that point we'd have gone yes there's a market yes we can sell it and yes can people are buying it but are you really going to go up against amazon Fortunately, there wasn't an Amazon mm -hmm. kind of gorilla behind us in beauty. Um, and then it was, you know, can we execute it? Can we get together enough money to build the website, to buy the stock, to do the initial marketing? You know, um, all that, all those kinds of things were part of that process of, you know, as we were doing that research and asking these questions, um, our enthusiasm for the for the project was only building because we were getting this constant validation. Mm -hmm. And don't get me wrong, along the way, I had so many so many people said, no one's ever going to buy beauty products online because they want to touch and feel it. Um, what do you guys know about beauty? Which was the fat end of nothing, in fairness. Um, the brands don't want to be sold online. Um, so we were kind of early, but we still felt that there was enough there was enough activity already with beauty online fragmented mm -hmm. and by various things that clearly there was a consumer appetite. Mm -hmm. People were buying stuff. Strawberry Net was growing exponentially, albeit you know, with a lot of grey market product out of the Far East. So, yeah. You said that you were not, you didn't know about the beauty space. Do you think that was an advantage for you then or not? Have you read this in another interview? No, because I was actually talking to other founders talking about them not That's knowing an advantage. Um, not knowing anything about the space. And then the concept of the power of naivety, yeah. where you don't know what you yeah, don't absolutely. know. And you first you have to figure it out 
And also, if you had known, you wouldn't have entered in the first place because you're already biased in the way that you perceive the industry and what the challenges are. Whereas when yes. you don't, then you just like... Yeah, it's, it's no a great, book. great, great question. And you have absolutely hit, hit the nail on the head. We, when we looked at the real kind of barriers to entry, for us, it was more about can we... You know, can we scale it? Can we get consumers? Can we get the brands, et cetera, et cetera? Um, I'd come from an e-commerce background, from a marketing background. Richard had come from a finance background. If there'd been a third person, if we'd done what arguably we should have done was to engage with a beauty expert rather than just, you know, all of our girlfriends and friends and, you know, female relatives and what wives of friends that was our, that was our kind of research would you buy this online you know, what brands do you use what brands should we try and get all those kind of obvious questions if we'd had somebody from the beauty industry which the sensible thing would deem we should have done we should have gone out and got a third co-founder and gone we need somebody who really understands the beauty industry because we're we're, in, we're engaging in a huge project here but we didn't um and i wouldn't advocate that as a as a plan However, um, in our case, we were really lucky that we didn't because the challenges that we faced once we launched about getting the brands on board were immense. In beauty, you have this thing called selective distribution in Europe, which means that the brands don't have to sell, don't have to, sell to you unless you have physical stores, mm -hmm. um, which is how the likes of Chanel and Dior and you know, didn't have to go and be sold in Tesco's or in Sainsbury's or wherever. Whether they could control their distribution. Easier in Europe than other parts of the world, but we were operating within Europe. Mm -hmm. So the brands were very, very precious about where and how they how they were sold. So we thought we'll build this great website, which we did, and we'll go to the brands and say, you know, we've got this great website. We want to start selling your products online. And then they would say, okay, here's an order form and away you go. Um, the reality was obviously they didn't. Um, so we had to find other ways of getting hold of the brands. But your point about naivety would be if there'd been a third person in the room who knew the beauty industry, knew how it worked, they'd have said, okay, guys, look, this is a good idea. However, this is what I would do now. You are ultimately going to have to acquire hair salons. You're going to have to acquire spas. You're going to have to acquire hair salons so you can get brands like Kerastars because they won't be sold anywhere that doesn't have a hair salon. And if you don't have the hair salon, you can't sell it online. To get to the spa brands like Clarins and Elemis and Decleor and Talgo and all of these beautiful spa type brands, you're going to have to acquire spas, which we did. And to get the mainstream prestige and luxury skincare and makeup brands, you know, the likes of the L'Oreal Luxe brands like Lancome and Yves Saint Laurent and the, the LVMH Dior and Givenchy and Chanel and... You know, all of these luxury brands, you're going to have to acquire stores. And actually, you're going to have to have a minimum of three stores. Um, and that will probably take you, took us about three years to get Clarins. It took us eight years to get the Estee Lauder companies. It took us nine years to get Chanel. If somebody had laid that all out up front, who knew what they were talking about, we'd have probably gone, mm, do you know what? That's a big, big big barrier to entry it's a big hurdle um so we probably wouldn't have done it in fact i'm certain we wouldn't have done it so yes the power of naivety in this case very much true what we did do though we did realize within about six months of launching that we needed beauty expertise in-house because we were we were growing so quickly um so we needed and we appointed a beauty director like way too senior for where we were at that point but she stayed with us until a couple of years back do you think that was the right decision to hire somebody who was so senior yes at that time yeah um well we needed to because we needed that expertise mm -hmm. we were growing so quickly that actually i think throughout the whole feeling each journey we were always hiring way ahead of the curve in terms of the quality of people the expertise the background the cost of the people mm -hmm. because we were growing i think in the early days in the first sort of four or five years we were growing at about somewhere between 100 and 180 percent year on year maybe 100 and 150 percent year on year actually um and when we had on odd occasion kind of recruited for 
for the moment, the company would very, very quickly outgrow the capability. And we'd have to end up putting somebody in above them, which is always difficult. So contrary to the board's like um, comfort, often at the time we recruited really really senior people as, as we recruited the best people we could mm -hmm. and also we were in the fortunate position that we didn't have we didn't have an external master that we had to to answer to we hadn't gone down the venture capital route we, you know we were we were profitable we were making money we were we were able to make sensible business decisions and able to a high to high well so I've, or we yeah we 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 always took took that route of, of getting the very very best people we could and also people that we liked mm. i think one of the greatest things about being an entrepreneur or a founder is that you get to choose who you work with um when you think you're to work with people for like eight nine ten hours a day we have like a no dicks rule and i have that <laughs> everything that i'm involved in now having been through five or six years working with private equity i'm passionate about only working with people that i like how do you determine if people are dicks? Um, I think got pretty good judge character, mm -hmm. um, reputation, um, references, um, and do you know what I think? Uh, and I'm often asked this about about employment and about how you recruit. And we were never obsessed obsessed about formal qualifications. Um, I think the most important qualification was is can the person do the job. Um, can they grow with the company? Are they going to represent the company really well? But obviously the fundamental thing is, are they, have they got the qualification to do the job, i.e. have they got the experience or whatever it is? There are certain roles where we would obviously recruit based on formal qualification because the role just demanded it, whether it was an accountant or a you know, legal counsel or whatever. But, but in the main, we were never hung up on formal qualifications, maybe because I never went to university and Richard never went to university. I don't think Siobhan did actually either. But I think we we would make a decision on two candidates that, you know, after whatever it was, one, two or three rounds of interviews, based on who do we actually, if they're both equally competent, the, deci the decision is then gonna come down to who do we think is gonna fit in with the rest of the team? Who's, who's gonna, be a culture the cultural fit is so important i think especially in retail um and we have this culture of being very very supplier focused and very customer focused um and if somebody can't be nice and be kind and represent us there's a risk that they're going to lose us suppliers or customers you know that's a problem and, and again also they've got to work with us for eight or nine hours a day and we don't really want to sit around you know with people that we're like oh god um, so when we're recruiting, you know, the, the, if it's, if it's two people and one of them's got, you know, first from Cambridge and they're both equally competent, the other one's got no qualifications, but they can both do the job. It's not going to come down to the person with the first at Cambridge, unless they happen to also be the one that's not a dick. Mm -hmm. Um, the problem we have is when they're both lovely and they're going to fit in and, but then, then it might come down to, to the formal qualification, but mm -hmm. it's not. The most important thing for me was always, are they going to fit in? Because the disruption, and we've had it, you, know, you can never get it right all the time. We had, I think at the height, we had maybe 250 employees, which means probably over the 16 years of the company, we maybe had 1,500, 2,000 people went through the organization. Mm -hmm. You can never get it right. And when you get it wrong, the toxicity that it can cause, it's, it's just, it's a nightmare. Mm. How do you deal when you get it wrong? Quickly, mm. efficiently, surgically <laughs> remove them from the organization. Yeah. Um, you have to because because I think the longer, I mean, you're obviously within process, but, you know, the longer that you leave, you leave something to rot, the worse it gets. Um, and don't get me wrong, I think we got it right more than we got it wrong. We got it badly wrong once with a finance director who, Ended okay. up in jail for fraud, but yeah, it was a nightmare. Um, um, yeah. Um, how did you discover that? I think we just randomly, I think Richard's neighbor had heard that the guy had had some problems at his previous organization. So then we did some digging and found that things weren't great. Um, yeah, it was, anyway, he went to prison for fraud and it's a finance director. 
Uh, fi- actually, he wasn't finance director. He was a finance manager. Mm-hmm. Um, but still, he went. fortunately, he went to prison after he'd left us. Um, but you can't always get it right. No. But I think for the reason it's so important for me personally was, A, life's too short to work in an environment where you just, it's just not fun. Has to be fun, or why do it? I'm fortunate in, in that position that I can pick and choose on that way. But as a retailer, you know, our relationships with our suppliers is sank is is sacrosanct. It is the most important thing for me as a retailer, because if we lose a customer, it's really bad. Um, but we can find out what went wrong. We can hopefully fix it. We can hopefully appease the customer, and we can do our best to make sure it doesn't happen again. But there are three hundred million of them in Europe. If we lose a supplier because we've been dicks or we've been too mercenary or somebody has upset somebody, um, that's commercially like hugely impactful, but also could be game over. You think some of our biggest suppliers accounted for north of 10% of our revenue. You know, some of the bigger groups like LVMH or Procter & Gamble or L'Oreal, et cetera. So for me, we built the business on the basis of really, really strong human relationships, you know, and I still count some of my best friends are people that we've worked with over the last 12 years within the industry because we've just been, I think one of our points of difference is we, we were just easy to do business with. And that's the reason why, that's one of the reasons why we were super, you know, we were super successful mm-hmm. um, compared to our competitors. None of our competitors have had brands like Chanel and Dior um so we had the kind of the full range um and partly because we were just not mercenary like some of some of our competitors what other reason made you easy to work with i mean apart from being not being mercenary Mm -hmm. um i like to think because we know we knew about beauty and we know about beauty you know we 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 were we're very very good at customer recruitment, retention, um, engagement. We understood community. We brought in we brought in an editorial team before anybody else did. You know, we recruited Newbie Hands in 2008. At the time she was 2009, she was head, she was um, beauty editor for Harper's Bazaar. We went out and found the very best beauty editor in the, in the UK that we could to join the team. Um, we understood beauty, we understood retail, we understood you know, we were able to work with the brands in helping both access new consumers and younger consumers because those were the ones that was that were really engaged online. So we were able to help the brands get those consumers earlier on. Uh, I think we just understood the big picture, um, and we had a lot. You know, we we, we recruited some of the best people. Mm-hmm. Going back to your relationship with your co-founder. How did you decide to go into business together? Was it a deliberate decision that I need these kind of skills or is it because you liked each other? It was, I think it was both. So I'd decided that I was going to start another web design company. Um, and I was just chatting to him and I'd known him for several years. He was a good friend of, from a long time ago. I'd known him for several years. Um, and I just sort of chatting and said, I think I'm going to start another company. And he, and like I say, he was like, well, I wouldn't mind doing something different maybe we could do it together and there was an obvious fit i am more of a marketeer more supplier focused more media friendly if you like he's kind of shy but very very practical very very smart like i say very financially minded operational attention to detail lots of the things that i am not and it was an obvious fit it was like well actually if we do this you can take a whole load of pain away from me and you don't have to worry about the front facing stuff. Um, so it was an obvious fit. We both had a bit of, bit of money. We only put 35,000 pounds into Feel Unique in each when we, when we started it. Um, so it was an obvious fit and also we were good friends. Um, there were many moments when you question that because like any partnership, um, you put two kind of relatively dominant smart ish people together you're never always going to agree and sometimes you're disagreeing on things which are you know super important um and that's where having a board comes in handy when you're like 50 50 
which way does the decision go? Because mm -hmm. I am adamant I'm right and he's adamant he's right. Mm -hmm. um, and we would bicker a lot in the early days. How did you resolve the conflict? We got different buildings. <laughs> you don't spend I'm so kidding. much time with each other. <laughs> Basically, we used to bicker quite a lot in the early days when we were in a big shared office. Um, and we'd always resolve it. Yeah, you know, even though on an occasion I might go, right, that's it, I'm done, I'm out, I've finished, you can have it. Mm -hmm. And I'd walk off and then storm around the block for <laughs> 20 minutes until the steam had come out of my ears and then mm -hmm. I'd go back and apologise. So um, you would you would be proactive in going back and saying, like, calming yourself down and literally the... Wrong. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I wasn't necessarily in the wrong about my idea, but I was in the wrong about getting too emotional and steamed up about it, whereas he's very level-headed and mm -hmm. calm and... Um, so I'd be the one that would go, right, that's it, I've, I've had enough, I'm out. Mm -hmm. um, but then eventually as the business grew and grew and grew, we, we outgrew one of the offices that we were in where the warehouses were and we needed to move the marketing team separately. So we were like, you know what, let's get another building. I'll go there with the marketing team and customer services and you stay here. And then it was great. So is it more about dividing the responsibility where we you wouldn't have to? We did that very early on. Yeah. We yeah. did that very early on. But even then... As co-founders, so I was although I was CEO and he was COO, we were very much a co-founder team. There was no hierarchy between us what, sorry, whatsoever. Um, so on some decisions, even though it might have sat within marketing, it might have been so important to the company. And if Richard felt super passionately that maybe that wasn't the best thing, mm -hmm. you know, he has to challenge it. And if I'm super defensive about it, you know, it's can, can create quite a difficult dynamic. Mm -hmm. So sometimes having a third person is really useful. And in our case, we, you know, we had, by this point we had, you know, we had the CMO and we had beauty directors. So we were able to, but at times it's still, you know, it's still, it's still, you're going to get into some heated debates. So but we still pick now. He's co-founder of our new business as well, mm -hmm. but we have a third co-founder now. So it's mm -hmm. quite good because we can, we can all scream and shout at each other, but ultimately we can vote mm -hmm. because three people, mm -hmm. the vote's never going to go again. You know, the, the vote's never going to not carry. Mm -hmm. What did he teach you at that point in time? Um, About you. Uh, what did he teach me? Um, he, I mean, he's a, he's a very, very close friend, obviously. Um, he taught, I guess he taught me the, 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 the you know, you know, very few founders have the full gamut of skills. There are very few single founder led business from zero to whenever, you know, the Zuckerberg, Bezos, they're in the, they, they are kind of in the minority. Um, there are very few people that have the, complete set of skills to do that because a lot of those skills to take a business from nothing to that degree are kind of contradictory you know you do need to be able to build a business you do need to be outgoing you do need to go out and talk to investors and talk to suppliers and get people engaged and be you you know some degree of marketeer every you know every business needs that but at the same time you also so you need that degree of optimism and uh, enthusiasm but at the, sometimes that can be counter to the guy that's going well actually do you know what that's just going to cost too much we just can't do that we need to rethink that um and also you know for me i think the skills that i have um around the way that i work which is kind of probably at a more of a strategic and more of a relationship and more of a kind of promotional and relationship level a counterproductive to really focusing in and spending a lot of time in the detail and the weeds and and really analyzing the you know the effect and the cost and the implications of decisions which you do need to be able to do especially as the business gets bigger and bigger mm -hmm. so you know i think he kind of reinforced the fact that as great as i might have thought i was you know th this thing would never have happened without that set of skills alongside mm -hmm. and i think the reality is if I'd started the business without him, it probably would have gone bankrupt within a year. But the flip side of that is that he never would have had the nuts to go out and start the business because he would have looked at it and gone, you know, it's going to, how hard is it going to be to do this? How hard is it going to be to do that? With a much, much mm -hmm. more kind of different lens. Well, it's that creative tension 
hmm. where you both push each other on different areas that you're not skilled at. Yeah. And the magic happens is when you're both paying attention to what the person is talking about when they're knowledgeable in that space or that you can convince each other of your own perspectives yeah. and something even better comes up from that. Yeah. And you've got to have, you know, despite all of, I've just painted a very kind of like clashy, fractious thing, but that's like a very small percentage of the whole kind of 16 year journey. You know, most of the moments were harmonious and, you know, productive and we, where we worked really, really, really well together. Um, well, it's a success of a, of a business depends on the founders and the leadership team and how well they can navigate through the different challenges and the different phases of the business. Because, you know, life is hard, like things happen, things don't go to plan, things fall apart. And one of the main reasons why businesses don't become successful and what we're talking about early and what these financially successful or, be, or being sold or, you know, get to a certain level is because the founders are not able to resolve the conflict between each other. So yeah, I think, which can happen. Which, which has to happen. I mean, one of the red flags is when there are no arguments whatsoever and then there is that one argument and that's it. You walk yeah. out in a huff and you just never come, never come back. back. And I think that happens more often yeah. than not because it's the ability to cool yourself down, think about it, and then go back and re-enter and have that and comfortable conversation. Because what you can't, you know, the, ultimately there's still the important kind of role of leadership within all that because you do need to convey that kind of sense of optimism, of passion, of direction, of strategy, of clear direction um and you know the team need to believe they're on that path and it's going to happen um so the way that you manage those kind of conflicts between the founding team or between the you know the management or the exec team is just really important you know, from the lens of employees you know that stuff it's like being a parent you know no kid wants to see their parents arguing um I feel like we're getting kind of hung up on the arguing thing because it was a small thing, but 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 still, you know, it, it's. I think you know, it, 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 yeah, it was it was something that we managed. I think we managed it really really well mm. to the point where when I started the new company, Richard was the first call that I made. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to get involved in this new thing? I don't think we're hung up on that, and I don't think Good. that's painting a picture Good. at all. Good. Like you okay. were just arguing um, all the time. I think I'm going deeper into mm -hmm. that space because I personally find it fascinating about the relationships between the founders and mm. and also we see the shiny you know glory we don't see what actually happens behind the bonnet or behind the scenes yeah and it's absolutely normal to be able to have conflict and I think it's it's not the conflict itself it's the ability to resolve it that makes the difference yeah it's and and that's super important and I think but but the flip side of it is is despite having those moments, which you invariably will. I mean, I love my wife, but I will argue with her. You know, it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. But I think the flip side of it it's in, in the founder thing is, and I, and I have this with, with you know, various investments. I always get nervous of investing in a business that's single founder, mm -hmm. single point of failure. You know, that's a real thing. Um, a, because it's very rare for a single founder to have that broad, that super broad selection of skills that you need happens but it's rarer as a founder and i'm not an advocator of anybody that says you know oh i'm going to work 12 hours a day seven days a week and you know um that, that's a massive red flag for me because i really believe in work-life balance because i think it's going to make you more productive it's going to make you better at your job there's a whole bunch of stuff and i think this kind of 80s notion of you know work till you you know think what your fingers to the bone is just is just nonsense now so i'm curious in the early stages is that the attitude that you had as well and is it something no. that you, okay no i had to learn that and at which point way. so at which point did you realize that actually it's not working or let me rephrase that a lot of a lot of people come on the show talk about well you know if i one piece of advice if i can give myself is you know kind of like um not necessarily slow down, but, you know, it's okay. Things are going to work out and, you know, kind of pace yourself. And I don't know. I question like, well, if you did that then, 
would you have got to the phase to the stage to then say actually now I can have more of a balance so I'm curious what you think of that it's a it's a really hard one because yes looking back um you know I had twin girls I didn't have twin girls but we had twin girls 2009 so the business was three years old and at that point it was hard work growing quickly super fun you know the first six years of the company were the best mm -hmm. you make decisions stuff happens it's it's super fun but massive pressure late nights with twins work the next day working too hard really um but by choice do you know what it was fun um so it it didn't hit me hard too soon. You know, I was enjoying it. Probably wasn't great for my relationship because I, you know, I'd go home, you know, I'd go home and be on my computer for a couple of hours, answering emails and following it up stuff, stuff that really could have waited till the next day, or a lot of it, or somebody else could have dealt with. But you, because you, because it's fun and you're excited and you, you know, you, you're buzzed about the thing that you're creating. It. It doesn't feel like work when you're taking it home. But the reality is it is, especially to your spouse or to your kids as you're growing up. So I think it took me a while to kind of realize that um, the balance needed to shift. And I think that the way that it kind of happened was a combination of kind of physical, um, physically and mentally. You know, I realized that, I mean, I'm not exactly skinny now, but I was massive company had been going for three years I'd probably put on like four stone I was about three stone heavier than I am now um not exercising enough just eating crap during the day because I was so into working um you know, not moving enough all the things now that we kind of you know hopefully are a bit more conscious of and then the mental kind of impact start started to hit me as well you know I think a combination of not feeling great physically um, and not spending enough time at home and not getting out and not taking time for myself and all of these things that we know you need to do now to kind of for the betterment of your mental health I was not doing and I kind of found myself in a bit of a downward downward spiral for very slow creeping up to the point where it's kind of things get too far and whereas if you'd nip them in the bud but it was kind of you know, like 15 16 years ago it was different back then it was you just get on with it um so I found myself kind of getting anxious more and feeling a bit down when I shouldn't really be because we had this hugely successful growing company and amazing beautiful children and just like why do I feel like off and why am I getting stressed and anxious and worrying about stuff that you know I shouldn't be worrying getting overly obsessed with my own health maybe partly because I knew that I was becoming metabolically unhealthy by putting on loads of weight and, and not exercising enough and just went down this awful spiral of kind of declining mental health. So was it to do with your physical health because you were, you know, overworking, Difficult eating say, very well? Probably or... both. Mm -hmm. I think it's, a, I think, I, th I think, I think the two kind of go hand in hand if you're not looking after yourself physically. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, as we know, you know, you need to exercise not just for your physical health but for your mental health you need to get out you need to move you need to be in nature you need to be calm you need to do all these to sleep properly you know back then and sleep was not such a pillar of health as it is now you know mm -hmm. so it was I think I just went into this kind of decline of physical and mental health for a couple of years and it you know it was it's only when you get to the point where you think it kind of hits you that actually shit this is a really real thing now and if i don't do something about it i'm either going to have some kind of like proper mental breakdown or or worse you know i you just you know, so it was only through a combination of finding you know going through various therapists and things that you kind of i eventually kind of got myself to a position where um taking responsibility and accepting that you know what a doctor or a therapist ultimately is not going to give me a cure for where the direction I was heading ultimately you have to own your own health plan 
um, and a kind of you know combination of listening to you know really good advice on podcasts and eventually finding somebody who really kind of related to me from a therapy perspective and and just conversations with my wife it's kind of like you know it, it, you need to take ownership of it you need to take ownership of your physical health and your mental health and what you eat and how you sleep because modern medicine is not really equipped to do that no um and i was lucky that i kind of managed to break out of it what prompted you to go into therapy was there um, a pivotal moment getting yeah i think um i think it was realizing that it was beyond you know the the degree of anxiety and stress and i was never really i don't think i was ever really depressed but my mood being somebody who's genuinely you know enjoys life and is genuinely upbeat and optimistic my mood was way off what it should have been but the degree of four uh probably a couple of years i think the degree of anxiety gets to the point where you think because i mean it's it's an awful awful thing to go through feeling you know kind of panic attacks and yeah um you know and, and dealing with extreme anxiety um and you do get to the point where you think you have to fix this because you don't even want to think about where it could go if you don't fix it you know there's some horrible dark places that you can end up um and especially when you've got kids you know, and having children changed everything um yeah it's hard yeah when you went to therapy, did you click the first time with the therapist? No, I went through loads. Yeah. How many? Oh, God. Um, five, six, seven. And what what changed with a person that you felt this is this is working? I think I think the person I still see him now actually sometimes. I think the the, the thing that changed was finding someone who kind of that I had more faith in because I, I've i very much been on this journey over the last sort of four or five years of understanding wellness. My wife thinks I'm slightly obsessed by it, but it's worked because I'm much better physically and mentally than I've ever been in my life. Well, for an awful long time. But somebody who really kind of understands or somebody who shares the belief that, you know, A, you have to take control of your own health. You know, there are four or five key pillars of health, which is nutrition, movement, rest, um, et cetera. And yeah, just somebody who, who I could just relate to mm -hmm. and wasn't really obsessed with the, the problem that I had with a lot of therapy was very often it can be like, what happened in your childhood? And I'm like, I know what happened in my childhood. And of course it shapes um, my, my thinking and, you know, my thought patterns and my beliefs and all those kinds of things. But I'm, I know it so well, I don't want to keep digging it up over and over and over again. I'm more concerned with, I'm more interested in, in how I can, you know, how I can get back to a kind of positive mindset. And, um, and I just found this guy that was a bit more progressive and a bit more kind of, um, bit more kind of functional medicine kind of based you know so just a, a more modern outlook um yes and we just kind of clicked what did you learn your, about yourself during that process um do you know what? i don't think i learned anything that i didn't already know i think i just learned how to deal with the kind of you know this kind of because it all you know largely i think something like anxiety or worrying about health or becoming like kind of came sort of like quite an extreme hypochondriac for a while i think a lot of it is really about understanding that kind of bridge between you know your kind of your thoughts leading to kind of action you know um and 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 actually getting your head around the fact that um you, know, you can break that pattern you don't need to ruminate on things you know there are there are, there are other ways of doing things um yeah i don't think i learned a lot about myself more about how to how to respond to situations that is really a powerful statement about going to therapy not necessarily to learn something that you don't know because we all really know ultimately what yeah unless unless there's some is very secret from 
before you were consciously remembering stuff that might unlock something but there just wasn't in my case I don't and it probably isn't in a lot of people's cases which kind of I'm kind of skeptical about the whole kind of psychotherapy thing rather than a more cognitive approach to mm. you know moving on it's having the tools to be able to yeah. deal with it in the here and now and being having some kind of guidance as to what to yeah. do with the mental state that you, you but know, for me, I think it was mental. also a lot about. And I think it's probably it's probably true for a lot of people. I think, I think a lot of and don't get me wrong, I was not. You know, I, I know people with a much much more serious kind of mental health conditions. That, you know, you know, we still ran a company through it and came out the other side. But I think for a lot of people, you know, I think a large part of me coming through the other side was accepting that physically I had to make an effort. Mm -hmm. You know, I had to eat better. I had to get out and exercise more. I had to take time away from that kind of pressure of work or that, you know, the you know, I would say, right, I'd get home and go, right, I'm next half an hour, I'm going out on my bike or I'm going to walk the dog, you know, and kind of prioritizing my physical or my my well being, let's call it that. Cause it, I think it's a, I think it's mental and physical kind of go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. And I think if you are, I think, I think a large part of often a large part of kind of coming through the other side of let's call it a kind of broad spectrum kind of mental health issues i think it is a lot about diet it's about that nutrition it's about getting good rest it you know it's about you know um exercise i think exercise is i mean i, I say this like an expert but I think there's massive amounts of scientific evidence that says if you you know it should be your first port of call Mm -hmm. is get out and do some exercise well i look at it it's like what do you need you can't survive if you don't breathe so you need to learn how to breathe so partly yes. meditation yes that is, learning to I control your breath sort of the rest thing then sleep yeah. because you know if you don't sleep you can't you know you get alzheimer's my, number one. <laughs> my kids and my wife now think that i'm like a combination of a tech bro biohacker <laughs> So I've got an ice bath that I'm in every day. We've got a sauna going in next week. I am like not obsessed, but I just feel great. I just feel so much better from having like, and now I do it in my diary. I will put in my diary, you know, nine till 10 bike ride or surf or dog. I will, I will make sure there are slots in my diary that, you know, I can't, oh, I can't do a meeting then because I'm, I'm busy. Mm-hmm. Because I think it's just as important, if not more important, than a lot of the mundane stuff that we have to do. I think it also prevents you from doing busy work. You know, you could be just there sitting on, you know, scrolling on your phone, thinking that you're doing work. You know what? Just go outside. Yeah. Go for a run. I mean, you can do things. You can move your body in so many ways without having to even go to a gym. But I th I th yeah, you you actually can. And I'll often I'll do I'll do I'll just do a meeting on my phone, mm. walking the dog. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a massive fan of Zoom meetings, but where I have to do them, I will try and move around at the mm -hmm. same time. But I think the really important, I think that for me, the, t the the important point is that, yeah, we still built the company around all of those challenges, and I know that you know other people in the organisation had challenges as well. I think the great thing now, though, is that we can talk about it. Mm. You know, five, six, seven years ago, I would. Even I wouldn't be able to have this conversation with you because I would be like, I'm not saying that stuff. I'm CEO of a company. I can't. I can't afford to be seen with any degree of, you know, weakness. Weakness, especially not mental weakness. That would just be the end of it. Mm -hmm. um, What's giving so you thank the courage God, to? I think it, I don't have any more courage. I just think the. I just think the world has changed. So, so I mean, that gives courage when excited. other people are you know, being vocal about it, yeah. then that gives courage yes. to say, well, if yeah. they can do it, then it's okay for me to say that too. Yeah, I it's don't think I have courage because I didn't have to consider it. I didn't have to think, oh, can I say that? Have I got have I, have I got it in me to say that stuff? It's like, yeah, I'll talk about it because it doesn't require courage now, if that makes sense. Mm. It's kind of, I'm comfortable talking about it. It's like, yeah, it's fine. I'm not, I'm not ashamed of it. Mm -hmm. I think that's the difference. I think five or six years ago, there would have been a degree of shame. Mm. And I think that's true for a lot of people. Um, but also I just think, uh, I think in a way there is so much more information available to people now, you know, in 
in a way that is digestible, you know, from real sources of expertise. Obviously, there's an awful lot of terrible information out there as well. Um, but I think if, you, if you're sensible about, about where you look for it, there's some really amazing sources of information about, you know, building your own, you know, looking after yourself better. Mm. Um, I think we're really, really lucky in that respect. Well, I mean, with internet and having access to pretty much any information yeah. that you need, I mean, you've got millions of podcasts. You just need and to be careful about where you get it from. That's true. We have to be careful what you feed your mind. Mm. Yes. Going back to Feel Unique yeah. and the different phases of the business, I mean, you have mentioned that to 2012, the was bought out by private equity. We sold half the business to private equity. Mm. Yeah. What was that process like? Uh, so we, we'd had a lot of interest in the company from sort of like 2010 to 2012 from trade buyers mostly. So some pretty big names were interested in, you know, we were, we were growing really quickly. We were, I think we were becoming known as probably the more premium of the the beauty e-commerce businesses. We had a lot of it. So we had in, inbound interest from some big beauty houses, um, from some media companies. And we started to have a few meetings and we'd always, we set, we set out to become, <clears throat> like I say, depending on who we were talking to, we were talking to Chanel, we set out to become the ASOS of beauty, uh, the net of portrait of beauty. And if we were talking to Benefit, we were setting out to become the ASOS of beauty. But you get my gist. We wanted to become the de facto, you're going to buy beauty products online, where'd you go? You go to ASOS for fashion you go to feel unique for beauty that was our goal so every decision that we took was will that help us become the amazon of beauty the net supporter beauty or whatever so we we're getting lots and lots of inbound interest and we were growing really well we were we were profitable you know we 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 never didn't make money um so we were in a really really strong position <clears throat> and we were on track to become you know the asos of beauty if you like but we were getting all this inbound interest. And at the same time, me more than the rest of the, the team, but me more than the rest of the team was, was slightly nervous about ASOS becoming the ASOS of beauty or Boots getting their acts together online or Debenhams doing better or a new entrant coming from behind. <clears throat> all of this kind of like potential threats. So I remember saying, look, we, we've had this one particularly strong approach from uh, I, can't, I probably shouldn't name them, but it was a big media company, very, very well-known media company about possible acquisition. So I was like, well, we should at least talk to these guys um, because who knows what might happen in the future. We're in a great place, but this might be a great deal. So we, we agreed to engage in a conversation with them. And then we had a couple of others at the same sort of time and the big beauty company had sort of approached us. So we had a couple of conversations on the go and then randomly I met um, an m and advisor mm -hmm. and he sort of said, look, I can field a lot of these inquiries that you're getting and, you know, I can help you manage this process a bit better. So we appointed him and one of the first things he, said, he did was he said, look, we've got all of this interest from trade buyers mostly, but there's also a lot of private equity interest. And we were like, don't even know what that means back then. We'd never been out to raise money. We didn't operate in that ecosystem. So it was kind of new to us. But the the, the kind of, so we, so the, the takeaway was that if we did a deal with a trade buyer, it's probably going to be, that's it, it's gone. Um, it might take a year or two or three years of earn out. But ultimately, if we sold it to XYZ media company over the next two or three years, they're going to earn the whole thing, which is fine potentially, but. That's what's going to happen. Whereas if we did something with private equity, they could become a partner to help us scale the business, put invest in it, grow it, and then hopefully sell it for a much larger sum further down the line, which is ultimately what happened. Um, so we ended up selling just over half the business in 2012, December 2012 to private equity. I stayed on as CEO until April 2014. Um, we then brought in a new management team um, and I stayed on as, uh, on the board and part-time alongside that team for a few years. Um, we built the business up, um, changed management team in, let's say, in 2019. I went back. Um, 
we repositioned the business over the next nine months. Business had been losing money for the previous few years under the previous management team. Um, repositioned it, got it back to profitability, break even, and then COVID hit. Which obviously at the time, because we'd been able to get the business back onto an even keel, um, we were well positioned to take advantage of COVID from a commercial perspective. And the business you know, accelerated through COVID, did really, really well. And then we went through a sale process and you know about 2021. Had a lot. Who did you sell to? We sold to LVMH Sephora mm -hmm. um, in September 21. And then I stepped down in July last year. Mm. That's a that's a journey and a half. <laughs> yeah. And there was a lot of shit along the way. Can I say that on podcast? I swear. Yeah. <laughs> um, there was a lot of shit along the way. And, you know, it was, it was, you know, the, the private equity years were difficult. You know, the, the, you know, it's, it was a challenging time, but the only thing that matters is we started a business 16 years ago with 70,000 pounds, never raised the money, never raised any money, sold it 17 years later for 132 million to Sephora. I did not get 132 million or even half of that. Um, but the, that's the kind of narrative that matters mm -hmm. really. Um, everything else that happened and it's kind of, I, I, I can, I shouldn't say this, but it's probably like childbirth. Do you know what? You start there, you've got a whole load of stuff to go through. It's awful, a lot of it. But what matters is what pops out the other end. And that's really the takeaway for us. It's, you know, it's an incredible journey. Was it the right decision to bring in the private equity and to sell to private equity? Um, I am always like a left and right path thinker. Um, there's no right and wrong path, I don't think. You know, you will never know if we hadn't done that. I, my belief is that if we hadn't done that, we we could have carried on without doing anything for several more years because those threats that we perceived didn't really come in a significant enough way that would have put us out of business. So arguably, we I think we might have made some different decisions, which I think may have been better. Um, about how we ran the business and how we grew the business and we wouldn't have lost you know, a chunk of equity. So my head says, my heart says, we probably could have done better without it. But my head, which is very like left and right, I don't think it's a, left, I don't think it's a right and wrong path, mm -hmm. says if we had gone down that path, who knows what else might have happened? Something may have happened that may have negated all sorts of things and we could have ended up worse so don't it, it, it was great you know we, we, the the outcome the final outcome was fantastic and you know yeah maybe it would have been better if we hadn't but i honestly don't know i what i do know is that i would never sell part of my company to private equity again mm, why not um because i think i don't think I don't think we'd need to. I think you've really got to understand the challenges that they bring, you know, um, and don't get me wrong, there are some amazing PE firms out there. But for me, I would rather be part of the earlier journey. I would rather build, build the business up, perhaps with venture funding, and take it to a point either where we do a trade exit um, or we would potentially IPO it. But for me, I think really building a business up to the point where I think much more. It's, it would be much more exciting to build a business up to a point where, and an LVMH or uh, an Estee Lauder is going to buy it because you've created it from day one to there. Um, whereas once you bring in private equity, it goes through that whole kind of growth funding thing. Um, there's a lot of risks as a, for a founder going through that because you know they have various structures around how they provide the funding and you know, capital structures and. Um, which I, I just don't think we would need to go down that route. I think I think we kind of underestimated our own ability to 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 build a business to the extent that we did, and I think a lot of founders kind of can often do that. Mm. How do you? Talk but I do about know some amazing success stories mm. with private equity, and I know some companies that you know, friends of mine that have done super well and loved it. Mm. Um, but for me, it's just just not for me. Earlier, 
when we started talking, you're saying, oh, you know, I'm, I'm an unemployable and I'd never want to work for anyone. Did it feel like there was a boss at that point? No, and maybe that's part of the problem in that maybe they felt like the boss. Mm. Um, and which is fine if those individuals had huge amounts of experience in the sector or in retail or in e-commerce, but they tended to be kind of ex-Bain McKinsey management consultant, Stanford maths graduates and um, super capable, super smart, super smart and very often nice people, but mm -hmm. just culturally, I don't think they ever really understood the importance of the DNA and the culture and the relationships that the business was founded on. I think very often private equity can get a bit too deep in the weeds without really understanding the impact of some of the decisions. Mm -hmm. So looking back and having the experience that you've had, giving advice to a founder who is planning their exit, what advice would you give them? Oh, um, it's really difficult because every single scenario is very, very different. I think you need to have a very clear objective in mind and you need to have a very clear objective about what you want after the transaction, especially if you are going through a partial sale or a private equity deal. Do you want to stay on? Can you stay on? You know, very often, even vent and I'm a big fan of venture. If very often they are amazing at showing you a lot of love during the process. Um, because it's their job. If they don't get you over the line, they don't have an acquisition. Um, so you need to really understand, really get to know them properly. Speak to portfolio companies, businesses that they've invested in before, businesses that they've brought or sold before, but don't just speak to the ones that they give you. Find out others. Because if by definition, if they give you a reference. Much the same with uh, candidates too. So I, so I think it's, yeah, I think it's super important that you really understand the people that you're going to be working with as best you can. And I know it's not possible to, you know, there's, there will always be surprises, but I think that's super important, especially if you're going to stay involved. Uh, and then I, th I think in, 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 and then, you know, in terms of, of an exit, it's very easy to get blinded by dollar signs. Um, and it's not always about the biggest number because, you know, you need to make sure that the acquirer can complete, you know, and even the biggest organizations may not be in a financial position to ultimately complete depending on the size of the transaction. So you need to, you know, but again, you know, anybody going through that will have appointed, you know, lawyers and accountants and a whole bunch of other consultants to see, to see through the process. Um, and also enjoy the process because it's always going to go on longer than you think. It's fucking stressful. You know, it's like the best moment of your life, your career, period. But it's also incredibly intensely stressful and difficult because it's not going to be six weeks. It's going to be six to nine months generally if it's a reasonable size transaction. There are going to be many moments during that process where it's over and they're walking away or you're walking away or something's come up that changes the price or changes the dynamics. You know, there's a lot, there was a lot of sleepless nights. Um, yeah. I, 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 should enjoy every, it. Should every founder think about and plan an exit strategy from the beginning? No. And I think that's the first thing you need to think about is do you actually want to exit it? If you've got a business that's doing well, and really your businesses should be doing well, you know, I'm, kind of super cautious about businesses that are on an endless cycle of funding rounds oh you know we're going this is our seed and we're going to be raising three million then we're going to do a then we're going to do a seed round it's going to be x and then we're going to need to do a, a series a and that's going to be five million and and then in three years we're doing our series b and we're going to need 50 million then and then we're going to raise 100 million it's like what the fuck is this it's not a company it's just a it's just a money pit um so I'm always a little bit cautious about businesses that don't have an ultimate goal of making money. 
And 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 if your business goal ultimately is to create a company, which is primary objective is at some point to make money. Um, if it's making money and it's doing well and it's growing and you know, really think about, do you actually want to sell it? Is that your goal? Because this is relatively new thinking. You know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, people would build companies for legacy. You know, maybe it's, you don't, you don't have to run it, but maybe you can get to the point where you put in a chief exec and you sit on the board and you take a huge dividend every year. That's not a terrible outcome. Um, maybe it's something your kids can go on to run. Maybe it's something you want to build up over time. You know, historically businesses were, were legacy, legacy institutions often. So I'm not, I'm not obsessed about the kind of the exit. I think you need to think about if it's what you really want and don't get me wrong. It's what we wanted. Um, it's not a bad thing, but I think you need, I don't think it, I don't think it's the only way. No, for sure. So having exited yes <laughs> what now so i thought i would just go surfing and sit on a couple of boards um I did still, you even manage to do that uh, I, I do it more than i more than i more than i did when i was running feel unique mm. um so i'm passionate about surfing i also sit on the board of a business called waldencast which is um was a spac that listed on the nasdaq and bought milk makeup and a badgie skincare so that's super interesting. Being on a on a Nasdaq listed board mm -hmm. brings you know, it's in, it's really interesting challenges and dynamics and okay. um and so I thought I'll do that and maybe one or two other things and surf and spend more time with kids and stuff. Um, but then an idea came along, you know, back to that kind of like trajectory idea thing, which was to launch a teenage skincare and makeup brand. Um, kind of inspired by my own kids and this kind of discovery that there isn't really a holistic brand specifically for teenagers makeup and skincare one which is designed for their skin but also more importantly going back to the whole kind of mental health thing you know teenagers more than anyone now are super at risk of you know poor self-esteem you know the advent of tiktok and social media kind of proliferations and screens and this constant comparison there's a really high risk and i see it in my own kids and, and, and some of their friends of of um, kind of being exposed to this kind of narcissistic view of beauty. So the idea that if we can create a brand that's not only designed specifically for teenage skin and, you know, teenage uh, aspirations in terms of branding and colors, and but also one which is positioned in a way as a parent, which is kind of, is like a safe entry point to, to beauty. It's kind of like not from that kind of narcissistic, sexualized way of beauty. You know, one of my kids, at the time we were having the original conversation about possibly doing something, had a, she was 12 at the time, Better Than Sex Mascara. Mm -hmm. It's a great brand. Two Face is an amazing brand. The product's great, the pricing's great, the ingredients are good, but she's 12. Mm -hmm. And then the other one, the other twin goes, well, oh, I've got this NARS Better Than, uh, NARS Orgasm Blush. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh God, as a dad. So we're having this conversation and we kind of came to the conclusion that actually maybe there was a market and when we started to come out and validate, you know, going through that whole kind of process, the more we spoke to people in the industry and spoke to people in the media and, you know, the idea kind of got more and more impetus. But one of the couple of things that kept coming through was the first was that as a parent, if somebody said to me, my teenager is going to buy some, wants to get into clothes, fashion, what brands do you recommend? Even me as like a very unfashionable dad, I know you could go to Brandy Melville, Bershka, Urban Outfitters, Hollister. Teen brands, teen clothes, teens go there, they love it. It's cool for them, but as a dad, I'm fine with it. It's, you know, the product's good. They're not being ripped off. They're not being exploited. It's an easy answer. Go to go to Brandy Melville. If you ask me about a beauty brand, I've got a teenager who wants to get into beauty, what brands do you recommend? There isn't, even the eye in beauty, there's, there's not one where I'm going to go, go there because that's for teenagers. Mm -hmm. So we we're like, actually, maybe there is something in that. So, you know, two years ago, sitting in a beach, a water park in Mallorca, had this crazy idea and we're launching it in August. Mm -hmm. Indu, I-N-D-U. But I'm not running it. So we've got an amazing CEO in Richard, the co-founder of Feel Unique is the COO. Um, I'm kind of acting CMO at the moment. So I'm, it, I'd say it's probably... 
three quarters of my time. Mm. But the reason it's three quarters of my time is because it's really exciting and it's fun and it's like being back to basics again. Mm. Um, but it's three quarters of my working time. I still am diligent about having me time. Hmm. I think it's such an important message. Like spending... You're you know, never going to get those moments back. No. I do the school run every day I'm in Jersey. Mm. Every day. And I don't need to. There's a bus stop outside my house. Mm. And my wife constantly says to me, why are you taking to school? You're spoiling. Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, because I'm never going to get that time back. They sit in the car with me. They'll talk to me for like 45 minutes, which is very difficult with teenagers. Um, we have fun. I get, it's just, I learn so much from them. It starts my day. You know, I drop them off at eight o'clock and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm up and ready to go. Um, and I don't need to do it, but I just love hanging out with them. You know what I mean? So I think, you know, those, and I, and I could work my nuts off for the next five years, build this business, sell it. Um, and then when they're 18, they'd moved out, you know, it's like, you're never going to get those moments back ever. You will never regret the time you spent with your no. children. Like no matter how much you no. spend, it's just, it's, it's that bonding time yeah. and like the most precious moments. Yeah. So, so important. So my final question yes. for you, what seems impossible to you now, mm -hmm. but should you achieve it will change the course of your life or your business? So the phrasing of that question is quite tricky because, because I don't think, I don't think in terms of impossible because with Feel Unique, there were lots of people who said you shouldn't do this for X, Y, Z reason. And arguably they would have used the word, this is impossible. You're never going to break through. You're never going to own beauty. The brands are never going to supply you. The heritage brands don't want to be sold online. Women are not going to buy, women with 95% of our consumers at the time, are not going to buy beauty products online. This is impossible. And I didn't believe that. Um, so we did it. And fortunately in this instance, it worked. And I think in terms of the new brand, um, which, you know, I don't, you know, it's, it's a very, we, 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 we are setting out to create a global brand. Um, and that's a big ask. It's a big challenge. We, you know, we want to create the, in this case, we want to create the Hollister of teen beauty brands. Um, I think for a lot of people that would be overwhelming and potentially impossible. Um, but if you don't try, then it is impossible. Cause you know, so I don't think there's anything that, to ask your question more directly that I'm staring down the barrel of going, if this impossible thing happened would change the course of my life. Cause I don't mm -hmm. tend to think that mm -hmm. I think we're reaching for some difficult things, but I think it's when you reach for the things that are difficult, the great things tend to happen because, you know, then you can look back and go, well, you know, we did that. Where can people find it, sign up and wait for the launch? Or... So you can sign up on indu.me, www.indu.me is the website. Band launches uh, online in the end of August. Um, we're in conversations with multiple retailers around the world at the moment. Um, but the plan is to launch in the UK initially. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Pleasure. Aaron. I really enjoyed talking to you and your insights and your story. Super, super interesting and very valuable. That's great. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Thank you so much for joining me here on Anatomy of a Leader. What were your takeaways? And if you haven't already, I'd love for you to subscribe and follow this podcast. And I'll see you in the next episode.